button. Okay, so we had uh, three discussion questions on the table. Um, first one being, what's the thesis of the text? Um, second one being, what is intersectionality and how does that inform the reading itself? And then finally, what stood out to you most about the work of Harriet Tubman? Uh, who would like to share what was discussed in your breakout room? Uh, I can go. Okay. I'm so sorry, I'm in my uh, dorm cafeteria, so it's kind of loud. Okay, That's you good, bro. Uh, so as for the thesis of the, uh, the reading, generally it just highlights that uh, there's more to Terry Tubman than just being like the leader of the Underground Railroad. Right? Uh, and it also highlights how that she was very articulate and tactful and like actually insanely intelligent in how she carried herself and how she wanted to travel to. Thank you, Lil. So essentially the, the um, article brought more depth to the work of Harriet Tubman opposed to just focusing on the Underground Railroad. It kind of spoke to some of her other um, work as well as just her intelligence as a whole. Uh, thank you. Who else would like to share what was discussed in the breakout room? I can go. Okay, thank you, Cole. Um, something else about the thesis uh, that we were talking about was uh, about kind of preserving Harriet Tubman's legacy and like protecting it. And um, they mentioned that Russell Simmons video multiple times where it's like, if, if like her legacy was regarded better than a video like that wouldn't have been made. She's just kind of been relegated to like this like figure that people don't really know that much about. Good call out, um, especially picking, picking attentive to how the author used that video to kind of further problematize how we understand um, Harriet Tubman. Great, thank you, Cole. Uh, let's get one last one before we move on. Carlos, what did your group discuss? Carlos Bonilla, what was discussed in your uh, breakout rooms? Um, Destiny, what was discussed in your breakout rooms? So something that was discussed in our um, breakout room was uh, how overlooked she really was and how she was known for just the railroads. And besides that, like people would underestimate her and not really know what she was known for. So thank you. So I'll go. I'll go through my notes, and then um, we'll see about a fishbowl. Um, well, then we'll move into a fishbowl. Excuse me, because I want to offer you the opportunity to get your second one in for the semester. Um, but I think you all kind of hit the nail on the head, right? You're just wanting to add like a deeper understanding of who Harriet Tubman was and the work that she did. Um, but for me, one of the first things that kind of really leaps up off the page as it pertains to Harriet Tubman, um, it says that she is often described as an illiterate woman um, who could never neither read nor write. However, her abilities to read the world from curing sickness with her knowledge of herbal medicines to navigating the natural terrain via the night sky through her knowledge of astronomy remain key in escaping and rescuing others from enslavement. So. To me, um, what the author is doing here is one, um, disturbing this notion of literacy, right? So she is illiterate in the sense that she can't read um, or she can't write, but she has the ability to read the world, right? Um, and, and not only does the author do a phenomenal job of like disturbing how we understand and conceptualize, conceptualize literacy, um, but for me, if you take this claim made by the author and try to trace it back to some of our earlier conversations within the semester, um, things like the, um, the Dogon Society, right? Um, the Dogon Society being the um, group in West Africa who was able to climb up a mountain and view Sirius Star A and Sirius Star B with their naked eye hundreds of years before modern science 
invented the telescope to be able to view series stars A and series stars B, right? That's a direct, that intuition, that intelligence, that brilliance that resided within the Dogon that allowed them to do that type of work also resided in Harriet Tubman and, and her ability to navigate the stars to move her people to freedom, right? Um, they talk about her knowledge of, of medicine to heal individuals. Um, and I, I know I mentioned this text before, but I, I know we haven't read it, but it's the work of Maladoma Patrice Somme. And the, um, Maladoma Patrice Somme, the book is entitled Of Water and the Spirit, but what essentially serves as his autobiography, right? And within this autobiography, um, Maladoma is someone who was intended to serve in between two worlds, right? He was kidnapped from his indigenous African home and transported, if you will, to a, a French missionary school where he was learning the word, the world, the world of the white man is how they played it, placed it inside the book. Um, but when he comes back to his home in West Africa, um, he has to go through a rites of passage to be able to incorporate himself back into the native traditions of his, of his community. And the role that he's supposed to play within his community is to be the community medicine man. His grandfather was the medicine man. His father became the medicine man. And he is to inherit this tradition, right? And part of his uh, ritual is to, one of, part of one of his rituals, right, is to sit in front of a tree and wait until the tree transforms, okay? And as the story has it, Maladoma is sitting in front of this tree for hours, um, I believe for this particular um, initiation practice, he has like a 12 hour window to see the tree manifest or shape change forms. And I believe it's like the last hour um, of, that he has left to see the, the tree manifest. And he talks about the tree turning into this beautiful, magnificent green lady. And she gave him a hug and she whispered in his ear, all of the science of the plants, right? What plant is for healing? What plant could be used for food? What plant is poisonous, right? So I, I bring this up to say, right, that that intuition that was embedded into Maladoma through the wisdom of the Green Lady was informing Harriet Tubman in the way that she was able to view plants as a conduit for healing, right? Has anybody, um, I'm, you're all familiar with peanut butter, right? Everybody knows what peanut butter is, but who knows who created peanut butter? Does anybody know who the, the creator of peanut butter is or invented peanut butter? Uh, Washington Carver. Yeah, George and, Carver. Yeah, and also I think it was like a lot more other things with peanuts, not I, just peanut butter, but yeah. Yep. Um, he also invented the, the potato chip as, as well. But here's what's significant about um, George Washington Carver. And he talks about this a lot in his autobiography, um, that everyone positioned him as a very obscure and weird little boy, right? And they called him weird because he would have conversations with the plants. And he would say that, so everyone else would hear him talking to the plants, right? But what everyone else did not hear was the plants talking back to him. And he said it's through this com communication that he got the knowledge of turning a peanut into peanut butter and all the other properties that he was able to um, manipulate peanut the peanut into, right? So again, this is just another example of African people having this very profound relationship with nature and being able to understand nature at a level that in our common understanding, right, we would call weird or whatever else crazy or however else we would classify that. But this is direct in alignment with how African people related with nature prior to European contact. Um, this is on page two. It says they're talking about a symposium that um, they placed to honor Harriet Tubman. And they said during the second day of the symposium, members of the Underground Railroad Project of the Capital Region Incorporated led its symposium in attendees on a local tour that included a visit to Troy, the site of Tubman's daring rescue of Charles Now from a courthouse where he was held captive as a fugitive and where townsfolk at Tubman's prompting broke in, ushered Now away from authorities and across the Hudson River in 1860. So like this kind of think about what was just mentioned here, okay? There's a person who is being imprisoned by the name of Charles Now. He's being held in a, in a courthouse. Um, Harriet Tubman gathers the town folks of that city, right? They 
rush the courthouse, liberate George now, Charles now, and, and move him across the river to freedom, right? So it's one thing to think about sneaking away from the plantation society under the cover of night while you're perceived, um, you're, you're under the belief that the overseer is asleep, right? It's one thing to sneak, but it's a whole nother thing to be as bold and audacious as to run up in a courthouse, right? Liberate somebody from the courthouse and then make it to freedom, right? So this just speaks to the gall and the agency of individuals like Harriet Tubman. Um, and, and this is to Cole's point, right, towards the bottom of page two, the author states somehow the historical Tubman remained beyond our 21st century um, graphs buried underneath distorted and outrageous interpretations, right? So this is at the very end of page two leading to page three. And this is how the author makes sense of the video of the Harriet Tubman sex tape. Right, she's saying that the um, the brilliance of so of Harriet Tubman is so beyond our conceptualization in the 21st century. It allows for these type of satirical productions to be manifest. Right, and, and another way to think about it, if we really understood the work of Harriet Tubman, there would be no way that we would be able to produce type of um, enter entertainment, if you will, at that level. And, and, and I think this is a very profound point, right? Because essentially what she's saying is for us to, in the 21st century to look back into the time of Harriet Tubman um, with our understanding of how the plantation society operated, right? It was a totalizing um, society, right? It was all encompassing, it was pervasive. Right. So to have that understanding of the pervasiveness of that society and of that culture, but then to think that someone is able to um, sneak away, free themselves. Right. First, free yourself and then come back 13 times and free 70 people is beyond our comprehension. It's beyond our um, expectation. It's beyond our understanding, right? And because of it so, being so far beyond our understanding, we come up with things like, well, maybe she had a sex tape of the overseers that allowed her to um, blackmail the overseer to get freedom, right? So this is what the article is arguing, and this is how the article uses that vi that sex tape to make their point. And I think it's a really good point that's made there. Um, so some little details about her work as a, a as a liberatory force. It says, yet Tubman's role reached far beyond her most famous one as a conductor of the Underground Railroad when she made 13 trips to the South and rescued approximately 70 slaves or enslaved people from the plantation, according to the most recent biographies. Um, she was also a Civil War veteran, nurse, community organizer, woman suffrage, and border crossing migrant, the later explored by um, Dan J. Broiled in this issue. So for me, right? couple of things that really stand out from this passage. One, 13 trips, right, from the north back to the south and bringing with her approximately 70 individuals and in, in, in ushering them to freedom. But it also says, according to the most recent biography, right? So for me, just like the age of African people, I would assume the more research that's done around the life and the work of Harriet Tubman, it may be more than 70 people who she was able to bring to freedom, right? And then um, a Civil War veteran, like to me, that's a, a phenomenal piece of information, right? Um, a woman Civil War veteran at that, right? Um, who's a part of the women's suffrage movement. And then here's what's really brilliant. She's a border crossing migrant, right? So she was able to traverse from the United States across that Northern border into Canada, right? And it makes me think of um, the work of Paul Gilroy and his text called The Black Atlantic. And the thesis of this text is to um, study and provide like a, ge a genealogy, if you will, of how Black folks traveled across the, the Atlantic Ocean, um, whether it be forced migration or just through their own desire to migrate, right? And he says that the Atlantic Ocean is a site of investigation to look at the happenings of Black life, right? And to me, as he's investigating the Atlantic Ocean and how we are able to traverse this Atlantic Ocean, Harriet Tubman 
belongs in the same conversation. Maybe not in the sense of her crossing the Atlantic, but she's crossing a border and going to another country, right? And she's moving um, freely, if you will, um, within Canada, within the United States, right? So this adds another layer of conversation to the work of Harriet Tubman. Um, and then we also find in the article the intersection between Harriet Tubman and Ida B. Wells. They said Mother Tubman, as she was called, held up above her head the firstborn infant of Ida B. Wells Barnett. And we know her from last week's reading or video, who had gave birth earlier that year and presented the young Charles Barnett to the audience as baby of the association. Um, and again, it talks about the linking of these two historical Black women. Uh, mm, okay, so then they moved to her work within the women's suffrage movement. And um, it says, of course, Tubman herself contributed to this larger than life portrait. It's talking about her work under the Underground Railroad. After attending the NACW convention, Tubman um, later went on to a women's suffrage meeting in Rochester, New York in November of, 19, of 1896 led on stage by Susan B. Anthony, the elderly Tubman declared to another, um, sorry, to another appreciative audience, how I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years. And I could say what most conductors can't say, I never ran my train off track and I never lost a passenger, right? So she's saying, I've done this Underground Railroad for over eight years, uh, the 13 trips back and forth from the South to the North and back. Um, or the 70 people who I've liberated, right? I never ran my train off course, nor have I lost a passenger, right? So this just speaks to the, um, the perfection of her craft that Harriet Tubman had in regards to liberating African people from the plantation. Um, and then as she continues in the article, right, to kind of uh, highlight the work that women can do in crafting a narrative emphasizing her role as an underground railroad conductor, Tubman val validated the struggle for women's rights. Moreover, Tubman's stories remained um, reminded women that if she, a woman, could transgress the race and gender limitations of, that forbid women from navigating the world and freely crossing the borders between North and South, Canada and the United States, and to do so without a help from a man, if she, a woman, could lead a successful um, battle during the Civil War, then surely women deserve the right to vote, and the right to full citizenship, such a complex history seamlessly weaves women's rights and the rights of African Americans, right? So what she's doing through her life's work, she's arguing for the agency of women, right? So not only was I able to liberate 70 Africans from enslavement, fight in the Civil War, right? And, and just the fact alone that I was able to do these things shows you that women have right places in these roles, right? If I could do these type of things, then damn sure we should be able to vote, right? So this, her life begins to critique these um, patriarchal notions of how society is being constructed, right? And then to me, this notion of intersectionality, right? Um, it says, because of Tubman's and the lives of other prominent Black women reflect the intersectionality, multiple oppressions, and thereby, and thereby multiple forms of resistance, they needlessly fall through the cracks, as Smith puts it. Smith further laments that you have to be able to talk about race and class and gender simultaneously. And obviously that includes, uh, eludes people's capacities, right? So intersectionality is the ability to view race, class and gender as accesses and systems of oppression, right? And with your ability to view race, class and gender as accesses of oppression allows you to take um, race, class and gender as modes of liberation as well, right? So it would be incomplete to say that we're gonna engage in a black power struggle that will provide racial equity, but we're not gonna engage in a conversation or a discourse or activism around um, patriarchy. Right, that's an incomplete revolution. So you want to be able to have a movement that's going to address class, race, gender, um, um, sexuality, oppression, and all the other isms that there are. Right. Um, you know, I'll I'll, um, I'll leave my notes there. Um, we'll, we'll put a pause there on my notes on intersectionality. Um, 
Okay. With the time we have left, I would like to do a fishbowl and then have a, a broader conversation about the reading. Um, is there anyone who would like to fishbowl? I'll go. I haven't done one yet. Okay. So we got Cole. Who else? And if not, I'll just call on people at random. Remember, you have to do at least two a semester. Um, Khalil. All right. So we have Cole, Khalil, and I'll call um, Kimberly. Are you prepared to do a fishbowl today? Yeah. Okay. So we'll go with you three. And whoever wants to start it off, Cole, Kimberly, or Khalil, it's on you. Can go. I'm just going to read my journal. Okay. Um, so I said the thesis of this uh, reading concerns the legacy of Harriet Tubman, how it is misunderstood, and the efforts some have taken to preserve and protect that legacy. The reading explains that many do not speak of the true nature of Tubman's work because it is so, because it is intersectional and therefore beyond simple glossing over. Just like Ida B. Wells, she worked as much in furthering the cause of women's rights as African American rights because they were intertwined. Tubman was a complex and multifaceted woman who gets relegated in context to what I think, um, to I think an older time that maybe we don't know as much about, but she was more modern than people assume. And she did much more than leave the Underground Railroad. I had no idea. She led a successful civil war battle. In regards to the modern world, the article reference, references an idiotic video Russell Simmons produced called Harriet Tubman's Sex Tape. This video shows total disrespect for Tubman and demonstrates the need to keep the truth about important historical figures fresh in the minds of the public so that something like this would never be created. Thank you, Cole. That was perfect, man. Kimberly or Khalil, it's on you. Um, I can go. Uh, I just found it crazy how I only knew Harriet Tubman as um, as somebody who led like people who were enslaved through the Underground Railroad. And I didn't know that she was like a nurse, like she knew astronomy, she was really good. Like they don't teach us that in school. So it's just crazy to think how there's so much more to Harriet Tubman, like how she fought for women's rights. Um, there's just so much that was kept from us. Like there's, and I just didn't like how like they made that that video on like her having a sex tape supposed to be like it wasn't it, it's not a funny joke you know like that's somebody who like she did so much and I feel like she just she deserves respect and it, I feel like that's what I took from the reading. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, so one thing I'm like was briefly touched upon that I found like very interesting was. Uh, how how I understand intersectionality, right? Uh, for me, it was like because she's a black uh, woman, a lot of her other accomplishments were like swept under the rug, and it could be argued that it's like solely because of these like prejudices, and like that remains today with a lot of things. I don't have any examples on hand, but like, yeah, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. And, and what I would like, what I like what was done really, um, one, Cole's ability to link the work of Ida B. Wells to what was going on with Tubman, because um, I, I think they both suffered the same type of um, treatment in regards to them being like relegated to the rear or, or even just effaced and erased it and kind of glossed over. Um, and and, and I, I agree with Kimberly, right? Like it's a lack of respect to have, um, you know, I understand comedy, right? And, and there's a there's a um, there's a thought process in comedy that no one's beyond the joke, right? Everyone's is, is able to kind of get that joke, which I get. Um, but there's certain things and certain people that I feel should be beyond reprieve, right? And, and um, Harriet Tubman is one of those people. Um, by and large, Russell Simmons would not have the platform that he has. He would not be who he was if it was not for the work of Harriet Tubman. Um, so I, I definitely agree that there's that respect and that homage that should be paid. Um, and then two, again, the, the importance of intersectionality, right? And, and I also like the, um, and I'm gonna link together Khalil's meditation on the importance of, of intersectionality and also Cole's um, thoughts around how 
Harriet Tubman is really beyond her time and how we kind of want to place her in history and keep her back there in history. But a lot of her work and a lot of her thinking it was even bef before, sorry, not before, is even more advanced than our time now, right? And I think that's a very good point because um, in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, right? you see a, a real a prolif proliferation of like black women is literature, black women is films and things of that nature, right? Think about how long ago Harriet Tubman was doing this work, right? And, and it's only until the late 70s, 80s and early 90s that you start to see a movement of black womanism, of black feminism, whether it's manifested through um, film, whether it's manifested through literature, right? Now, I, I wanna be clear though, right? I'm not saying that there was no such thing as black feminist prior to that because by and large, you would consider Harriet Tubman a black womanist, right? Like the work that she did sat at that intersection. Right. But I'm saying from a literary movement standpoint, right, from an artistic aesthetic standpoint, it wasn't until the 70s, 80s and 90s that you started to see those things kind of come to the fore. Uh, I'm thinking the likes of um, Alice Walker. I'm thinking of Terry McMillan. I'm thinking of Bell Hooks. I'm thinking of Audre Lord. Right. Um, um, these are the, some of the people who were able to produce this black woman is art, this Black woman, this literature, and these Black women, this movies, right? Thinking of movies like Color Purple, thinking of movies like Waiting to Excel, right? Thinking of movies like The Woman of Brewster's Place, right? So these are these movies that are, are really um, ca canonical, right? They're, they're part of this canon that was really important during those times. And again, to Cole's point, right? You don't even think about attaching Harriet Tubman to that type of movement but Harriet Tubman set the foreground for that type of movement, right? Um, I'm curious to hear how, what others thought about the reading or the work of Harriet Tubman. Um, I'm curious to hear what others um, found of interest about her work that you just didn't know before. I'm just looking at your um, message right now, Raphael. Yeah, that's cool, man. You could just put whatever your comments are in the chat if you like. Um, did anyone watch the the parody video from Russell Simmons? Did anyone look that up? I did. You did. Here, I, I think it's worth looking just to kind of excuse me, worth watching just to kind of see how fucking ridiculous it is. Give me one second. Let me see if I can pull it up. It just made me think of like uh, Dave Chappelle, like because he. He talks about stuff like that, and he uh -huh. he ma he makes videos like that, like that the parody of like Roots or whatever. Right. Like that was like it was funny, but it was also like saying something, you know. Yeah. So this was just like ridiculous. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. Uh, Raphael is saying I found it amazing how she couldn't read or write, but yet still managed to handle tasks without um, any excuses or complaints. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again. Um, but more importantly, Raphael, you're absolutely correct, but then just to disturb this understanding of what is literacy, right? Because um, many of us who can read and write can't read the stars or can't look at herbs and say, okay, this one can heal you, this one will make you sick, right? So I, I just think it's another way to look at knowledge and look at how knowledge is validated, I think is another important aspect of that portion of the um, article. Um, I think I wanna play, this video just because it provides a little more context to the um to the parody instead of just the parody itself because i think it's kind of um anti-educational just to even play this without the without the context that's provided in the second video um so we'll watch that it's, it's 10 minutes and then we could kind of have a good discussion about that i failed all of my classes in high school and ended up dropping out Hey guys, so I had planned on doing a Franny's Granny video today and I actually filmed it and I changed it last second because I wanted to stay fresh and topical and talk about what's going on in the world. Um, and for those of you that are new to my channel, I do make comedy videos here on YouTube, but I also try to talk about serious stuff too. I've talked about slut shaming, date rape, body image, LGBT rights, uh, safe sex, racism, probably most famously. So I've talked about a lot of things 
And I try to do them in a comedic way that is funny and entertaining, but is also uh, educational and smart. So today I really wanted to talk to you guys about YouTube comedy and social responsibility. And the thing that influenced this was a video that got a lot of attention this week that has been since taken down that was produced by Russell Simmons called Harriet Tubman Sex Tape ADD History. And started a bunch of YouTubers, including Jason Horton, Daystorm, and Shanna Malcolm. And the video got pulled pretty quickly because if you can judge by the title, it was awful. And it was really bad for a few different reasons. Uh, it was like a reimagining of Harriet Tubman gaining her freedom basically by using her sexual prowess, which was the concept. And I had a few issues with this video. Yeah, I'm sorry, y'all. I, I can't just listen to her talk for 10 minutes. So. We'll watch the actual video. I just I don't I don't have that in me today. So <laughs> give me give me one second. Bitch, and I'm gonna be telling everybody. Network all deaf digital released a parody video that immediately had Twitter and the blogosphere in an uproar. The video was titled Harriet Tubman Sex Tape, and it depicts actress Shauna Malcolm portraying the famous African-American abolitionist having sex with her master while being filmed by another slave. Check this out. Harriet. Harriet like a hot girl. Master, I've got what you white folks like to call leverage, and I'm going to be telling everybody about your Negro love, including Mary. <laughs> <laughs> like anyone's gonna be. Not surprisingly, the video offended multitudes of people and it was quickly taken down. But how did it get up there in the first place? And, and, and when it comes to the most painful moments in the African-American experience, where is the line between comedy and bad taste? Your guess is as good as mine. I, like you, saw it come through my stream. And um, at first I, I, I thought it was just some kind of, um, you know, Twitter rumor or someone just talking, but... Um, I, I, I found the link, it came across my a timeline, clicked on it, and I was I was floored. I couldn't believe, number one, that someone would think this was funny. I mean, satire is one thing. There's a way to do satire. There's a way to do smart comedy. But it got me to thinking, you know, how in the world did that that whole process from performance to, to cutting to the editing room to going to uh, distribution and marketing to uploading to YouTube, at what point does someone not say, no, this, this, isn't, this isn't right. This doesn't even make sense. Um, and, and so I think last night I was up until like four o'clock in the morning tweeting and looking at tweets. I'm trying to figure out for myself, just like you, Mark, how does something like this happen? And I think we're all still trying to kind of wrap our heads around it. It's problematic on every possible level <laughs> imaginable. It's almost a parody of itself. Uh, and a parody of how desensitized a lot of people are when it comes to, you know, history, right? Because we're used to the very casual disrespect of contemporary Black women. So this is somebody who's associated with hip hop. We could have a whole nother conversation about the women, the, the images of women in music videos and the images of Black women on television. But people like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Coretta Scott King are typically safe from that level of disrespect. So this is a new this is new territory. This is a new line that's been crossed. Um, there, there's the issue. The sexual. I guess, I'm sorry. I'm no. still somewhat speechless, even though I've written two thousand words. About it. <laughs> there's still something. When I think about it, it just kind of takes your breath away. Russell Simmons also issued an apology on his website, Global Grind. Uh, he says, "In the whole history of Deaf Comedy Jam, I've never taken down a controversial comedian." When buddies from the NAACP called and asked me to take down the Harriet Tubman video from the All Deaf digital YouTube channel and apologize, I agreed. I'm a very liberal person with thick skin. My first impression of the Harriet Tubman piece was that it was about what one of the actors said in the video, that 162 years later, uh, there's still tremendous injustice. And with Harriet Tubman outwitting the slave master, I thought it was politically correct. Silly me. I can now understand why Silly so many you. people are upset. I have taken down the video. And lastly, I would never condone violence against women in any form. And for all of those that I offended, I am truly sorry. Tara Conley, I saw your Twitter feed after he mm. released that first apology, and you wrote this. You said, I'm seriously tired of apologies at this point. 
I want an overhaul of folks who have access and power to certain media platforms. After this entire week with everything that's been going on on Twitter, I, I'm, I'm honestly and genuinely sick and tired of apologies, particularly public apologies. If we want to have a conversation about the nature of public apologies, we can do that. Mm -hmm. What I want to see is real action. I want to see impact and I want to see influence. And when we talk about, when we even looked at uh, Russell Simmons' apology on Twitter, and he used LOL yes. as a follow-up. Let, 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 let me show them. Let me show the people that, Tariff. The first one said, I get it, and I respect that the Harriet video has, has been removed. I was hopeful after that. Then I read the rest of the statement. He also wrote this. I guess I have a sensitivity chip missing, LOL. Haven't been mm -hmm. in trouble since Def Jam. Sorry if people are hurt. Whenever somebody says, I'm sorry if you're upset about yeah. what I did, to me, that is the wackest apology possible. He also said, you know, I have thick skin. He said, you know, I'm, I'm fairly liberal. It was almost as if he was saying, I'm going to say, I'm going to apologize because you're asking me to, but I actually don't think I did anything wrong. I, I don't know how anybody says that. That's, that's nonsense when you start talking about final edits and what you didn't know was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you were bent over on your knees with somebody behind you. So at any point, the, 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 so, so I, think, I think, Mark, what we are seeing is, and I think what we have to recognize is that there, is an, there are multiple generations of our people who have no historical context, and that is our fault. It is our fault because we are not having conversations with our babies at the dinner table, yeah. that we don't know um, our own history. And, and I think that's obviously a small part of it. But, but, I, but I think that the only way you can feel comfortable being involved in that kind of project is not having historical context, is not knowing, I think, what, um, what, what, what we've talked about, um, uh, not just about the sex itself, but, but how many times have we talked about movies that are connected to slavery and young people that will laugh because they don't have context, young people that are desensitized to the reality of what slavery was, and then entire generations of people that say, why don't we just get over it when they don't really understand what they're talking about getting over. And so I, I think sometimes we dismiss that as black people just being angry and oversensitive. But the reality is it is the foundation for so much of what the imagery uh, that is that is continuously perpetuated in this country stems from. Absolutely. And so we've got some of our own kind of kind of healing process and, and conversation to do. But I think at the end of the day, um, Tara said it right, there's got to be accountability and there's got to be action. And, and if we just keep having these kind of conversations disconnected from holding people account accountable from an economic standpoint for the projects that they try to put out and then simultaneously putting our money behind people that will actually have a level of sensitivity to the truth, we're not going to see anything change. I think that was a little bit more of a... Um, Where all your tabs go, everywhere you go. I think that was more of a, a deeper, involved conversation um, than the first one. Let me kind of look at the chat here. <laughs> it said they had to write the film, edit the film. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of was echoed also in, in the video commentary, Khalil. Uh, it's not just a... It's just a figure. Cool. Thank you, Carlos. Um, yeah, so so what are y'all thoughts on either what was mentioned in the video that we watched or just the, the ridiculousness of the video itself? Um, one thing one thing I do want to say, right, to, and it's not to excuse Russell Simmons, because um, I think he has his own issues. Um, if you look at his history with women, right, he has his own problems within itself. But um, what I do know of, like, Deaf Comedy Jam, um, all deaf media, right, like, and again, this is not to excuse Def, um, not to excuse Russell Simmons, right? Like they they have comics, comedic com comedians, excuse me, that will come in and do these videos, right? So it, somebody, it's, it was not his idea, and they're, put, they're placing a lot of the blame on Russell Simmons because it's his platform. But again, someone had the thought to do that, and I think that person should ju be just as guilty or just as accountable as Russell Simmons. Not just because Russell Simmons is the big name, but that's who we go after. But the woman who played um, Harriet Tubman should be implicated, right? The person who wrote that should be implicated. We can't just um, have it stop at Russell Simmons because he's the big name. And I, and I think that's something that was kind of missing in this discourse. Like, I, I, 
I don't believe that it was his idea. I do believe he gave the green light, right? But it was someone else's idea. And that person is just as, in my eyes, is just as implicated as Russell Simmons, because to me, probably more implicated because it was their idea. You know what I mean? Um, but I'm curious to hear y'all thoughts on anything we covered so far. Um, it's funny because recently, like in a lot of my classes, uh, we keep talking about topics of like comedians and whatnot. And of course, like the whole Will Smith thing and Chris Rock thing that happened a week or two ago. Um, I mean, that I don't even see what, how that was even like funny or trying to be funny in that video. Um, but him as like a person who's above it, like he should definitely see what's being produced under his name. That like, you know, you should not let anything like that you know, go out and stuff like that. Um, there are, like, PR stunts and whatnot, but, I mean, it, it's just really, like, when it comes to comedy, like, okay, like, is it going to be funny? Is it going to be related? Like, usually, uh, comedic, like, in the comedy industry, people try it out, you know, they tell people, you know, you get other people's opinions. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone got it, that video's opinions, but, uh, yeah, that was a really bad uh, video I mean I can't even see where they were going with that like it wasn't even like trying to be clever or anything I I don't know it was just really bad tasteless for sure I agree Connie. but uh, but yeah most definitely on top of uh, Harriet Tubman too I mean growing up like to me it was just kind of like oh like Underground Railroad and literally that's it yeah. I literally that, that that's all that came to mind until like I actually like read this passage and I was just kind of like, whoa, okay. And I guess that's where uh, intersectionality comes in, right? I don't know if, I don't really get the definite, if the definition is the compiling of everything and then just making it one thing, you know, where it's just like- It's uh, more of being attentive to the multiple systems. To multiple, okay, yeah. okay, 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 yeah, because it was definitely, because I definitely, I mean, that's how I guess it was taught to me, you know, it was just kind of like, oh, you know, like African Americans, like Harriet Tubman, like freed slaves, that's it, literally, like, that's all that comes to my mind, and then now it's like, wait a minute, we well, actually, yeah, I mean, you know, she is a female, you know, and like, People don't even. I took a uh, women's studies course, and people don't understand that even when uh, quote unquote uh, Africans were free in America, I mean, the women also had like it was literally the white man, and then it was like the white woman, yep. and then it was like other race males, yep. and then their other race females, which are even lower concerned lower of course in the hierarchy of how they had it established but yeah i mean they've had it like way worse it was really hard for them too so it's really interesting to see how harriet tubman was actually involved in a lot more than what i thought she was yeah good call out connie thank you man and then too it's like it's not to diminish like the phenomenal work of the underground railroad like that that is brilliantly dope work like you not to diminish that but then to think that that's a small piece of her overall story provides just another level of brilliance to her um any other last comments okay let me point out what our reading is for next week give me one second So for next week, uh, we're going to get into the work of Kwame Ture, or formerly known as Stokely, Stokely Carmichael. Um, so read Keiki, uh, Ready for Revolution, PDF. I don't know how long it is. Let me see. Um, OK, it's a little bit longer than our normal readings. Um, it's 22 pages, but it's an autobiography, and, and it moves very quickly. Um, in, in fact, if you read closely, um, you'll see that it's going to talk about the origins of the Black Panther Party. Um, so give yourself some time to engage that. It's, it's a real quick read. It's long, but it moved. The pages move quickly. It's a page turner. Um, I will email this out to you all tomorrow, but you know where to find it if you don't want to wait till tomorrow. Um, I'm going to post um, Khalil's concert to the Google Classroom site for both classes. And he's also placed that in the chat. I believe it's the 14th of this month. Um, so please, if you can make it to that, please do. Um, that will be extra credit. I will ask for you to do uh, produce a journal as well. Um, outside of that.